everybody. Welcome back to the Retro Horror Academy. My name is Daniel Richardson, and tonight we're going to be looking at the year in horror, 1956. Uh, we got six people we're going to induct into our Horror Hall of Fame, and we got four films that we're going to rank from this year. So let's just get into it. Uh, time for the uh, horror class of 1956. Coming in first, we got Wallace Ford. He was an American director. He directed over 80 films. Uh, some movies that we didn't cover that he did, uh, Bowery at Midnight and Pillow of Death. But on this show, he's, of course, known for The Corpse Vanishes. Uh, that movie gets a lot of crap. I'm not saying it's perfect, but overall, I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, you know what? He's in. If Bela Lugosi's in, guess what? This guy, he, he can come in as well. So there you have it. Uh, up next, we got Evelyn Key, American actress, best known for her role in Gone with the Wind. Uh, the only movie we didn't really cover that she was in that was horror adjacent was, uh, or horror, uh, was uh, The Face Behind the Mask. But on this show, we know her for uh, Before I Hang. And uh, yeah, this is another film of mine that I really enjoyed. Uh, so yeah, I enjoyed her performance. So, Evelyn, you're in. Up next, we got Val Luton, Ukrainian writer and producer. Uh, this guy was known for... Uh, producing low-budget horror films for RKO. Uh, of course, Cat People was his big breakout film, but he wrote and produced a ton of uh, successful horror films during his uh, career. Uh, Boris Karloff uh, credits him for uh, saving his career at one point. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 1951, uh, so he wouldn't have been around for the class of 56, unfortunately. Uh, so movies that he did that we did not cover was the, the Leopard Man, Bedlam, and The Body Snatcher. However, the ones we did cover... On this show was Cat People, I Walk with a Zombie, The Seventh Victim, and Isle of the Dead. Uh, yes, you know what? On top of just making great movies, and I'm a huge fan, uh, especially two of those are uh, in my top ten. Uh, I Walk with the Zombie and the Isle of the Dead. But, uh, you know, this dude literally was, like, he, he set the prototype for, you know, Roger Corman, or even like Jason Blum, you know, just taking low budget and high concepts and making money and getting a return on his investment, you know? Um, and yeah, you know, and the fact that, you know, he wasn't just trying to make cheapy horror films either, you know, much like, you know, the other two would do like this guy was trying to make art. He was trying to not just cash in on the, you know, movie monster matinee, you know, kid crowd. He was trying to make horror films for adults. And, uh, yeah, you know, again, uh, some of it was hit, some of it was miss. You know, it is what it is. Even in his time, the critics didn't always love it. But I think now he's considered a legend. And yeah, definitely deserves to be uh, in this Hall of Fame. So there you have it. Uh, so moving on next, we have Glenn Strange, American actor. Uh, known for Gunsmoke and other westerns. However, this guy would play Frankenstein's monster three times. Um, the only thing we didn't really cover that he was in was uh, Masterminds. But on this show, we know him for uh, The Mad Monster, The Mummy's Tomb, The Monster Maker, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Uh, yeah, you know what? The dude, synonymous with horror, uh, even though he never reached the heights of, uh, you know, Karloff or Chaney or Lugosi, uh, still yet, you know what? He was a, a distinct part of horror. And not just that, uh, not just for rocking so many, you know, roles within the, um, you know, universal uh, horror universe, uh, but, you know, a little side trivia here, when Boris Karloff died, uh, the picture that he used in the paper in Hollywood, it was a picture of Glenn Strange in, in makeup or whatever, so it's like, yeah, like, you know, it, it, even then, he, you know, his role, his iconic look, you know, kind of overtook things at, at times. So, uh, no, Glenn Strange definitely deserves to be in the Horror Hall of Fame, so congratulations. Uh, moving on. Next, we have Edgar Wallace, British novelist. Um, he was a former war correspondent, but he would go on to become an internationally recognized author. Um, he would, uh, after kind of writing a lot of books, he would become a writer at RKO. Uh, unfortunately, though, he would die of uh, diabetic uh, complications shortly after uh, finishing King Kong. So he died, you know, about 1935, uh, too, too, too soon for sure. Uh, at one time, they said that 25% uh, of all the books that was in England were written by him. 
Not sure how true that is. That seems like kind of a fantastic thing. But then I don't know how many books there's in England at the time, so who knows. Uh, either way, uh, there's been over 160 films that's been based on his writing. So uh, some stuff that we didn't cover that he, he did. Before Dawn, King Kong, The Terror, uh, an episode of Inner Sanctum, Chamber of Horrors, and uh, The Hound of... Uh, Sorry, the Hound of Baskerville. Uh, oh, try that again. The Hound uh, of the Basketvilles. Uh, Baskervilles. My God. I'm not going to do it again. You know what? Fuck it. You guys know what I'm talking about. The Sherlock Holmes movie. Um, anyways, the uh, movie that we did, that we don't, uh, you know, we covered on this show uh, that he helped write, was The Human Monster. Um, it's one of those cases where you know we didn't really cover a lot of his work at all, but he was so prolific in the world of horror, and we continue to be so even after we induct him here, that, uh, yeah, it'd be a shame not to have him in our Horror Hall of Fame, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, Edgar Wallace, welcome aboard. And finally, we got George Zuko, British actor, uh, primarily known for playing villains, uh, usually mad scientists. Uh, some notable works that he did that we did not cover would be uh, Dead Men Walk, uh, Voodoo Man, and Scared to Death. However, on this show... We have covered him in The Cat and the Canary, The Mummy's Hand, The Monster and the Girl, The Mad Monster, Dr. Renault's Secret, The Mummy's Tomb, The Mad Ghoul, The Mummy's Ghost, Return of the Ape Man, House of Frankenstein, Fog Island, and The Flying Serpent. Um, I've mentioned it before, you know, I truly think that he is just one of those hidden gems from this era. Uh, I think as far as acting goes, he's on par with with Karloff, Lugosi, and Chaney. Uh, I would say even better than Chaney as far as acting goes. Uh, I think the problem was he was never a monster. That helps. If you are, you know, you actually portray one of the biggies in the universal world, that helps kind of put you over. Uh, and he was never, he was always, I, I thought he never got, quite got to do, um, even though he was easily well-respected during his time uh, as an actor um, and everything. And But, you know, now we're doing this show, I'm glad we can kind of shine a light on the, his previous work i think he's a hell of an actor and definitely deserves to be in the horror hall of fame so congratulations george zuko and congratulations to all six uh you know you're now a member of the horror hall of fame go ahead and come in and take a seat among the greats so guys we have four films we're going to rank for you four horror movies of 1956 so let's get into it at number four we have man beast uh this woman she goes on this uh, expedition uh, in the himalayan mountains she's looking for a brother uh, her brother was off, uh, going off in search of the Yeti and uh, went missing. So she's trying to find him. And uh, her and her party come across uh, his former campsite. And they find uh, this guide who uh, claims that, you know, he was the one that was, you know, he went with the brother, you know, when he went missing. And so right off the bat, they don't, no one trusts this dude at all. And he definitely does, you know, because it don't matter. Uh, you don't really give him a reason to trust him because of, shortly after that, they are attacked by a... Uh, Yetis, and uh, turns out he has a huge secret, and he's got some sinister plans for uh, the girl there, so there you go. Um, There is lots of climbing footage here, and it was all kind of unused footage from this Mexican movie that was never made, Um, and so yeah, they basically just kind of, hey, we'll we'll use it here, and they do. I mean, there's a lot of glory shots of just climbing in this movie, Uh, and I thought first, when I I saw it, I was just like, man, like, is ice climbing, it's like, you know, mountain climbing new? Like, was it invented in 1956? Like, I know it wasn't, but it's just like, that's what I was thinking. It's like, my God, like, again, we're just getting close-ups and this awesome footage of climbing. And it's like, what the hell? So it makes sense now that I read that. I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I was like, my God, that's a lot of climbing. Um, in the credits, you'll notice there's an actor named Rock Madison. Uh, he's he's not in this movie. Uh, in fact, that guy don't exist. Uh, the director literally added him to the cast to make the cast seem larger Inflating the numbers. I was like, why? But whatever. Uh, Rock Madison. There you have it. Uh, turns out around this time, I guess uh, the uh, Bondal Snowman, Yeti, whatever you want to call him, uh, was getting um, lots of press. Uh, very similar to, you know, 20 some odd years before this with The Mummy uh, in Egypt. It was getting lots of press at that time, so they kind of made the movie The Mummy. And we get the same thing here. Uh, literally, they're just like, oh, Yeti, we'll make a Yeti movie. Why not? Uh, in addition to using just stock footage and the uh, climbing footage, uh, that was pretty much what the movie was all based around. They literally took, they had all this stock footage, they had all this uh, unused climbing footage, and they just like, you know what, we're going to write a movie about that. And that's what it was. So it was literally just a combination of, hey, the Yeti's hot right now, uh, we got all this climbing footage, we can make a Yeti movie. 
There you go. Uh, according to legend, uh, a lot of the mountain scenes that they were shot, uh, the cast and crew snuck onto, and it didn't say which one. This is a major studio lot to shoot the scenes. If it's true or not, who knows? But you gotta love it when uh, you get like little stories like that when it comes to these little low budget indie films. So I hope it was. I hope it is true. I hope they did sneak onto a lot and shoot their movie. The Yeti suit was actually reused. Um, they, they used it in the movie uh, White Pongo and the White Gorilla. Uh, I remember seeing the White Pongo. I don't know if I've seen the White Gorilla or not. It's possible that I have. Uh, a long time ago, I bought this box set. Back in 05, actually, because that's what it was. Uh, Peter Jackson's King Kong was coming out. And Alpha Video decided to release a box set called Sons of Kong. And it was just a bunch of men in ape suits movies. And uh, a ton of them. It was like ten of them. And I'm not going to lie, nine of them were just shit. Uh, the only one I really liked was... Um, Oh, B- Bella Gosi meets the Brooklyn Vampire or Brooklyn uh, Gorilla. Love that movie. Uh, un- un- ironically, too, like I just think that's a fun movie to watch. Uh, I don't care how cheesy or derived or how much they're ripping off Lewis and Martin. Uh, I love that movie. But anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, but I saw White Pongo in there. It was shit. And I said, I maybe the White Gorilla was part of that too. I don't know. If it was, I saw it. If it wasn't, I didn't because I didn't really go off and uh, start looking up giant eight movies. Until I started working on this uh, project here with the uh, Retro Horror Academy. Anyways, so yeah, if, if the Yeti suits looks familiar, that's why. White Pongo. Uh, so apparently, you know, whatever the budget was, typically, for these like Poverty Row, low budget horror films, this movie is even half of that. Which makes sense that they're literally sneaking onto the uh, lot of other places, reusing Yeti costumes and using stock footage and reused footage of climbing. So it's like, yeah. I can see there's like, you know what? You don't need that much money. Get out there and make that movie. Um, apparently, the director's future wife was the person inside the Yeti costume, at least early on. Uh, but apparently, she was too short and couldn't maneuver, and they swapped her out for someone else. Uh, apparently, after this movie was shot and completed, him and his wife would actually get married. And uh, after they were on, or as they was on their honeymoon, he took time out of the honeymoon to write Teenage Zombies, a man after my own heart. That's... Sounds like something I would do right there. Hey, you got movies to make. Doesn't matter if you're on your honeymoon or not. You got to churn them out. You got, you got shit to do. Um, so th- he tried to get this movie released by itself um, in cinemas. However, it was constantly put with uh, another film as part of a double feature. And I didn't even put this together until I read this, but it makes sense. He wanted to be a single feature so he can rake in all that money. However, when it's a double feature, you got to split that money. And so after this movie... He started uh, making two movies at a time just so he can purposely put them together as a double feature and then sell it that way so he can keep all the money. Smart. Very smart. Uh, when this movie was released, it came out to mix the poor reviews, which, yeah, I can see that. Um, for me personally, you know, I didn't mind this movie. I don't think it was a bad movie. Uh, in fact, I mean, again, I mean, regardless of how often they showed it, you know, the scenes of them climbing was pretty good. Um, I thought the performances were good. The story was what it was. Uh, and that, I thought the, the, the main girl, uh, the one that played Connie, I think her name was, uh, I thought she did a phenomenal job. However, it does seem like toward the end of the movie, though, for whatever reason, I don't know if she was trying to be like, it's just getting too much for her, and you know now that the Yetis are out, she's getting frazzled or what. But her performance gets really bad at the end. Again, I'm not sure if that was a choice or if she was just giving up on this movie, maybe. She's like, I'm fucking over it. Either way, I thought she did really good until you know the end or whatever. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. There was one thing I thought was a little bit ridiculous. Um, let me take a quick drink and I'll, I'll get you that. So, the the guy, uh, the one who's the guy that they're all suspicious of, and it turns out he's got a secret. Which, that was weird too. So, I watched this either on Tubi or uh, the Roku channel. Either way, though, I, I watched it from like a source. Well, like I just found some random source online or whatever. Um... It was one of those two, you know, stations or whatever. But um, when it comes to like him revealing that, you know, he he's a descendant of these Yetis or whatever, it it, it, like, it just does a hard cut, and it's almost like he's in mid sentence explaining like, yeah, I'm a descendant. And so it's like, I don't know if that was just if I got a short version, which I checked the times and it seemed like the times were pretty accurate. So it's like I don't know. Or if this literally just, that's how they made the movie, and it just, it comes off just, like, fucking out of nowhere. But, anyway, there's, like, no impact there when you find out, like, yeah, this guy, he's part Yeti himself, and then, you know, he 
I can't remember. I guess he was planning on basically expand. He's going to rape Connie. Basically, he was going to expand the bloodline that way, and uh, you know that way they can keep producing and keeping. I guess his bloodline going with Connie. Uh, but anyway, so people's been you know the, the expedition itself. People have been leaving or they've been getting knocked off. You know, one by one. And so when we're down to like the last two, our main guy and main girl. Uh, you know, they're making a run for it, and now, and then they, they tell they knocked out the bad guy. Well, he, he's, he's on their heels, but like, he's literally like, he's a mountain range away. Like, I know it's all part of the same mountain range, technically, but like, they're on one peak, and he's on the other. There's a huge gap between them, and it's just funny because she's like, Oh no, he's following us, and you look up, and he's like, He's good ways away, and you guys got the lead on him. And they're just watching him. And then he starts like to hammer his little spike in and then rolls a little rope through there and he's rappelling down. And they're just standing there watching him. And I'm thinking like, is this the equivalent of like, you know, like in the old movies like Mummy and the Wolfman, how when he would corner a girl or whatever in the corner, they would just stand there and scream as he inched closer and closer and then finally would just grab him and choke him. And you're thinking, why didn't you just run? Like you had a head start, you could have got out of there. This is kind of the same thing. Like, this guy literally is just like, he's smirking at him like, ha ha, I got you now. And then he starts to slow process of climbing down the mountain. And they're just standing there. And then the funny thing is, is when he's like dangling, the little spike he put in like comes undone and he just falls to his death. And then after he falls, the main guy's like, let's get out of here. And it's like, why didn't you do that before? Like, were you really just going to sit there and wait for this guy to show up and kill you? I don't know. It was fucking wacky. And I started laughing. I was like, this is so ridiculous. Um, up until then, this movie was made competently. And then it seems like at the last moment of this movie, uh, aside from the goofy looking Yeti, which I'm not going to count that against him because, you know, hey, you do what you do. But it's like, I don't know. That was just weird as shit. Like them literally just watching this man on another mountain slowly descend to come after him. Because you have to go down and then trek across and then climb up to them. Like it may take half a day. And they're just like, oh no, here he comes. Holy shit. I got him. It's like the Austin Powers scene where the guy is like, you know, literally like a quarter mile away from the steamroller thing that's moving inches and he's just screaming no and it finally runs him over, but it literally takes like a minute to get to him. Same thing. Like same goddamn thing. Uh, anyways, uh, but anyway, aside from that, I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't a bad watch. It was not a bad watch. Uh, it got a 4.2 on IMDb and yeah, that's probably about right. I went a little higher. I'd probably go a little higher than that. I get like a five or something like that. You know, it's in the middle, but kind of low half the middle. That's where it belongs. But that's just my opinion. But either way, there you have it. That was Man B. So we're moving on now to number three and the winner of the Bronze Skull Award. I am talking about the Black Sleep. Basically, this mad scientist, wouldn't you know it, uh, has a uh, wife who has a brain tumor, and so basically he's just kidnapping people and he's trying to, you know. He's experimenting on their brains to kind of figure out, you know, how he can stop his wife's tumor, you know. Uh, this movie stars uh, Basil Rathbone, Lon Chaney Jr., John Carradine, Bell Lugosi, and Tor Johnson. How about that for an all-star horror cast? Uh, the director is uh, Reginald LeBorg, uh, and he actually was, re- he replaced the previous guy. I forget who the previous guy name was, but uh, he replaced him uh, just because this guy was kind of a seasoned horror director, and that's what they wanted. So they kicked the other guy out and brought this dude in. Uh, this would be the final completed film for Bell Lugosi before his death. Uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, Lugosi, uh, he had three movies left in him. Uh, th- and this is one that he didn't speak in. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, still fighting that cold. Sorry, I know I was doing this last time. Uh, anyway, but this, you know, he was basically um, completely, you know, he played a death mute in this movie. We'll get to that here in a minute. But uh, um, this is the last movie he did while he was alive because the movie after this would be uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. And he only shot test footage, but he would die shortly after that. And Ed Wood's like, well, he's in my movie. And basically just inserted the footage in there and then just recast the role and hid the face for the rest of the film to play his character. And gave him, like, top billing, you know. So, uh, And then after that, another producer would basically take, like, stock footage of him as well and uh, splice it in the film. So, yeah, this was the last, like, legitimate film that he did um that he you know he made it all the way through with uh, as i mentioned before you know he was uh, suffering from health issues and that was the reason why the studio uh, decided to you know hire him uh in a make his role uh, a death mute uh, however i guess he had a lot of issues with that and he 
basically kept bugging the director, like, you know, give me some speaking role, give me some lines, you know. And the director relented and said, fine. And he shot him, like, in close-up and gave him a lot of lines and then just cut it all from the movie. Like, he knew he was not going to use it. And part of me is like, man, it's kind of a dick move if you tell your actor, yeah, let's shoot some footage, knowing you're not going to do it. But at the same time, it's like, well, would he have finished the film, you know? I mean, I, I bet he probably would have. I mean, at this point, it probably wasn't even a pride thing. He was... So poor at this point, and just taking any role possible. So I couldn't imagine he would have refused. Either way, though, yeah, that's that's you know, I don't know. I guess I would, I probably would have done the same thing actually. Just whatever you gotta do to get the you know footage, and then move on, and you can you know, you know, ask forgiveness later. You know. Uh, so, anyways, that was that was that right there. Uh, this movie is actually financially successful. It would make like you know 1.2 million dollars or so. Uh, of course, when it was released, it got a uh, mixed bad reviews. However, the one thing everyone did praise was a uh, Battle Rathbone's uh, performance. Uh, turns out, the hands during the surgery scenes, the hands you saw was actually a real neurosurgeon. They wanted to make make it look real, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I would have known the difference. I don't think if I would have saw, you know. Fucking Basil Rathbone's hands in there. I've been like, nah, horseshit. I, I don't buy this. I mean, I'm, I'm watching a movie about a guy who, you know, I'm watching a horror film. I'm watching a horror film from the 50s. I'm buying into whatever bullshit they're, they're peddling. My God, if we did that Ed Wood movie last time, I bought it. I bought into it, so why not? Pride the Monster, that's what it was. I bought into that, so why would I not buy into, you know, the Black Sleep? Anyways, um, the guy who played the Gypsy was actually not the original guy they cast. They actually wanted to uh, get Peter Lorre to play the Gypsy. Uh, but he wanted too much money, and they're like, well, sorry, can't, can't do it. Can't play ball. So that could have been another horror icon they could have had in this thing. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, I always love when you know, I hear you know different uh, marketing techniques they used uh, you know, at the time. Uh, apparently, they actually had, and this is weird from a low-budget studio, but they sent in uh, life-size wax figures of all the stars uh, to the theaters to promote this film. So I was like, eh, that's pretty fucking crazy, actually. I got to imagine they told me like one theater at a time. Though. I can't imagine they had like a mass market of these things and they're sending it out. So Either way, um, apparently director LeBorg and uh, Chaney, uh, they worked together four times before this. Uh, yeah, they did a... Uh, the Mummy's Ghost, and then they did like three Inner Sanctum films. So, you know, they were definitely uh, well-versed with each other at this point. Uh, you know what? I really like this movie. Again, it's, it's bringing nothing new. It's very predictable. It just, you know, it is what it is. But, I don't know, I love the performances. I, you know, again, like, I agree with everyone else. Uh, Basil Rathbone does great. Uh, even though it's not, you know, they're kind of nothing roles, it's cool seeing uh, Chaney and uh, Lugosi as, like, the henchmen, the heavies, if you will, uh, for Basil. And then... You know, again, I, you read the names in the credits. So I saw, you know, Carradine and uh, Johnson in this thing. And I just kind of forgot they were going to be in it. And then, like, the last, I don't know, half hour or so, you you know, you find all the uh, other experiments in the cave. And it includes these two guys. And it's just like, holy. And I love that. It really had a Island of Dr. Monroe feel to it. Uh, and I really dug that, you know. So I don't know. I, I, I like this movie. I thought it was, you know, really well done. Uh, if it was up to me, I would put this part a little higher. But, you know. Hey, I'm part of a committee. I do what I do. So anyways, uh, yeah, uh, IMDb has this at 6.0. And yeah, I'd actually probably go a little higher than that, actually. I'd probably give it a, a solid 7 easily. So, uh, but anyways, there you have it. That's number 3. That is The Black Sleep. So, moving on now to our number 2 horror film from 1956. And uh, the winner of the Silver Skull Award. We're talking about the Mole People. That's right. Uh, inside of a cave in a mountain. Uh, we got an uh, ancient race that's been there for thousands of years of, uh, well, mole people. So, uh, yeah, when this movie came out, it got mixed to low reviews. In fact, the, uh, the ending was changed by the studio. I, I shit you not. So, in the initial ending, you know, our two heroes get out, and then, of course, the girl that he kind of falls for, you know, of the mole people, you know, of course, she's different. She's, you know, the rest of them are kind of like albino, but the ones that aren't albino, they call them marked and, you know, so she's kind of an outcast in her own society, but, you know, she's, she's fucking hot. And anyways, um, you know, they all three get out happy ever after. And the studio's like, nope, you need to film it where she dies at the end. And that's when we get that crazy ending where they get out. And then, like, out of nowhere, there's a tremor, like an aftershock. And then, boom, a statue falls and, like, kills her. And it's because, and I quote, the studio felt that it promoted interracial relationships. And they could not have that. What the actual fuck? Ah, uh, 
I mean, I would say a different time, but it's like, even if it wasn't, I mean, let's say if it was a different time, let's say this is like the 20s, whatever, you know, we, we saw Blackface on this show already, or this channel already, so we've covered those movies, I get it, but this was literally like two white people. Like, you know, yeah, storyline-wise, one of them's a mole person and the other one's human, and they're both basically human. It's not even, like, interspecies. It's literally just, you know, this person's, like, you know, down in a mountain, and this guy lives above the mountain. And they thought that was too close to inter... What the fuck? Anyways, uh, yeah, so the some story elements uh, contains... Uh, or a lot of the story elements in this movie contains uh, bits of mythology from all over. Um... I'm not going to lie, outside of, like, Greek and even, like, Roman mythology, I don't know much. And uh, even, like, Norse mythology, I know, like, with the rise of Thor and the popularity of the Marvel movies, you know, I just know a little bit of my Norse mythology. Everything else is like, nah, nah, I don't know. Just Greek. Just give me Hercules, that's all I give a shit about. Uh, but anyway, apparently this, this contains a lot of different, you know, aspects of different mythologies, so... All right, so what I think about this movie, I hated it. I did not like this movie at all. I thought this was so boring the first half of it you know i thought you know it's funny because i thought man beast was overusing climbing footage my god they they did it hardcore in this and the other movie sort of has an excuse that you can slide in a low budget charming way because like you know it's a low budget studio blah, blah blah whatever but it's like they literally built their movie around footage they had like, there was no way to get around that. They had climbing footage, and then, goddamn, they were going to use it. Here, no. This is a mole people movie. You could have done this a different way. You didn't have to climb mountains at all. You could have literally just, like, dug a hole and be like, oh, shit, there's mole people down here. And no, we get tons of footage of the expedition getting to this part. And it's just like, my God, I was so bored out of my mind. And then once they get down there, it falls more into, like, I don't know. It reminded me a lot of like uh, those serials back in the day. Of uh, it was like the Phantom Empire and the Undersea Kingdom. Uh, Gene Autry was in the Phantom Empire, and uh, Crash Kurgan, I believe, was a uh, Undersea Kingdom. Either way, and I don't know. Like I like the concept of those stories, but I, I I didn't like the execution. I didn't like the serial format for one. That always bugged me. Uh, I guess it would be different if you're watching it weekly, but we watch them all in a row. It's just I don't know. It wears you out quickly. Uh, but it's so dull. Like, it's all dull, except for, like, the last minute. And then after that minute is over, and then you go back to the next, next you know, short or whatever, the next chapter, and then it's just back to being boring for like, until the last minute. Because you got to keep you hooked for the next time. And that's what this felt like. It was just gonna, like, you know, it does eventually pick up. But by the time it picks up, it's already too late for me. I don't know. I found this thing boring as hell. And it's got a 5.0 on uh, IMDb and a 43% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, so I wasn't the only one that didn't like it. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, the mole people. So now we're on to our last film from the year. Uh, the number one horror film from 1956. And the winner of the Golden Skull Award, I am talking about Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Uh, we got a small town, and uh, this doctor who comes back to town, he's starting to realize that, you know what? I think all these people are turning into aliens. And they're emotionless. <laughs> uh, this thing was played as a double bill with, uh, well, this movie had two titles. Uh, it was a, on a double bill with either The Atomic Man or The Indestructible Man. But either way, it's the same movie. I guess it depends on what region you was in. But uh, yeah, that was the double bill it was on. Uh, the term pot people is derived from this movie. Like, it came from this film. So, you know, it's creating our, uh, our dialogue in the lexicon uh, in the future. So there you have it. Um... Uh, in the novel, apparently, uh, the humans win this, like, outright. Like, we discover what it takes to win, and so we decide to spread the news, and, you know, we win. So, uh, that's the big difference between the novel and uh, the movies. Uh, anyways, uh, future director Sam Peckinpah, uh, he was a dialogue coach on this film, and he played the meter maid as well, so. Uh, we talk about crazy translations from other countries on this channel from time to time. In France, this movie is known as Invasion of the Defilers of Tombs. And they never changed it. Fucking weird. Anyways, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, apparently the framing story was added by the studio. Uh, because again, the book is one way, but they wrote it differently and left it more bleak at the end. And uh, in fact, that's, that's the whole thing. Like It ends with just, uh, oh, fucking Kevin McCarthy. I forget the character's name. But uh, it, you know, the main guy just on the 
on a highway just screaming at people, hey, they're already here. They're already, you know, trying to warn them and no one's listening to them. And that's how the movie ends. Uh, however, the studio's like, nope. And they uh, went ahead and added, you know, the wraparound. So, they, you know, they open it with that. But then they, you know, with him going to the institution. And, of course, they end it with, you know, people finding out they found these pods. And so now the authorities know, like, okay, this guy's telling the truth. And then, you know, there's hope. There's more hope at the end of this thing. So uh, that's what they're doing. Uh, this thing was financially successful. Uh, found out, you know, caught on. People people loved it. So, um there are themes of uh, conformity in this film, you know, either if you look at it from the side of like, you know, it's McCarthyism or it's communism, but either way, uh, you know, the theme of, you know, having to conform to a group of, you know, invaders in a sense, you know, going against what you want, going against your freedom, basically, uh, is very heavy in this movie. But it's funny though, because like the, like the director, the cast and crew, like they all deny, even the writer of the novel says that was never his intention. But I feel like, even if that was never their intention, much like, you know, you'll hear George Romero say, like, in the first Night Living Dead, like, you know, there's a lot of social commentary in that movie, and he goes, well, that was never intended. You're still, a lot of times, you know, what's going on in the world seeps into your work, into your art, and I kind of feel like, yeah, that's kind of the same thing here. Even though this book was, maybe, maybe the book was written even earlier than the Cold War, you know, still, you know, the idea of, you know, other people trying to take over, you know, whether it was Nazis even, you know, from, you know, the 40s. I'm not sure exactly when the book was written, but I can just see, you know, regardless, just the idea of an invading presence, an invading force taking over, you know, that's always in your mind during this, you know, time set. So it's like, yeah, you know, again, maybe it wasn't intended uh, to be, you know, the theme, but again, it reflects what's going on in society. So, um, sorry, yeah, the, Lost my track there. Uh, so, anyways, uh, apparently, I, I was really hard to believe, but I, I was reading, and apparently, when this thing came out, it didn't really make much of an impact with the critics. Like, yeah, the the, the crowd loved it, the audience loved it, financial success, but critics didn't really gravitate towards it. But they didn't really shit on it. It's almost like they just kind of it went under the radar, kind of. However, now this is considered an all-time sci-fi horror classic. Um, it would actually go on to spawn three remakes and so many imitators. Uh, yeah, uh, another little side note here. The fictional town of Santa Mira was actually used in Halloween 3. Carpenter is a huge fan of this movie, and that was his homage to that right there. Uh, the mine shaft that um, the aliens kind of chase our main characters into was actually the location of the Batcave from the Adam West Batman series. So there you have that. Uh, initially, this movie is going to have a lot more humor in it, and the studio, again, made him cut out almost all of it. Like, there's still some traces of it here and there, but for the most part, it was played more serious. And people complain about that, but I don't know. I think it's turned out just fine. I don't think it really hurt it one way or another. Um, I don't think, it, you know, any of it hurt it, actually. The framing story or the humor being cut out, but, you know, who knows? Um, apparently, Vera Miles was supposed to be, uh, or was considered for the role of the uh, main girl, and uh, Joseph Cotton was considered for the role of the lead guy. Uh, of course, I know both of them. I don't know what else they've done outside of Hitchcock movies, but that's why I know them from is you know their uh, roles in the two different Hitchcock movies. But either way, they're supposed to be in this movie, but for one reason or another, it just did not work out. Uh, so what well, I think about this, I love it. I fucking love this movie. Uh, in fact, uh, without trying to sound too over whatever, uh, I think this takes the top spot. I know we already did it once this decade, but. Uh, this, again, takes the top spot of my favorite horror film that we've covered on this channel so far. Uh, or, I guess, in the Rector Horror Academy. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of the others. And it's funny because I've never seen this version before uh, until just now. Um, I love, I, I, I think the 78 version is my favorite. But, man, I'm a big fan of the 93 one, too. I just, I, I think it's brilliant. Uh, I wasn't too big on the, I, think it, I forget what year it came out, maybe 07, uh, Invasion with uh, Nicole Kidman. But the second time I watched it, I don't know, I warmed up to a little bit more. I feel like if I watch that again, I may completely come back around on it. But um, I'm not as negative on it as I, as I was the first time I watched it. But either way, um, no, so this is the first time I actually get to watch this one. And yeah, I mean, I just, I thought it was amazing. I Again, there is just something, I don't know, because it's funnier, you know, I jokingly say it, but, you know, if any joke, there could be, an, there's always like that nugget of truth at the middle. I just feel like, you know, as long as, I don't know, I don't think it take much for me to conform, as long as the process is not painful. And I feel like in this situation, you just go to sleep and that's it. 
and then you wither away and your pod person's born with your memories. Maybe I won't be in it. I don't know. But for some reason, I just feel like I don't give a shit as much the older I get. Now, I say that. I feel like now that I have a girlfriend and I have a son, I'd be willing to fight a lot more, obviously, for them. I think if they got taken, I'd quickly join. I wouldn't even think twice about it. If my son comes to me as a pod person, he's like, Daddy, just go to sleep. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I am going to bed. And I'd join really quickly. But all that aside... Just the idea, I think, not necessarily being forced to join, I think it's, it's the build-up to it. I think what scares me most in these movies, it's that initial, you don't know who to trust, and there's so many of them, and it's almost like there's no choice. Like, I think it'd be different if they were just trying to be like, you know what, if you don't want to conform, you don't have to. We don't want to pressure you, you know. Like, they have brochures and shit, like, little, little pamphlets they hand out. That'd be different. But it's like, they're very militant. And they, I mean, even if they are coming at you with this message of peace, like, we're not going to hurt you, and it's not going to hurt, but you will do it. It's something authoritarian about it that just terrifies me. Like, in this movie, I feel like one of the creepier scenes was, well, there was two of them, but the, the, the first one was whenever, uh, they're, they're staying the night in the main guy, his office, his doctor's office, and... As they are hiding out there, you know, she's like, you know, the, the girl's like, what time is it? And he's like, it's 7 in the morning or whatever. And they're like, well, why is it so busy? And you notice that it's just the town's bustling. And then just at one point, they all converge together. And it's just clear, like, oh, my God, the town has been taken over. And I don't know what it is about that, where I find that the root of that. But it just that just frightens me. I think because my whole life, I've always been kind of on the outside looking in. And even like whenever I do finally go to the inside, then the inside gets turned inside out and I'm back on the outside. So it just seems like, I don't know, there's just something about that. I've always been kind of an outsider. And even when you want to be on the inside, I don't know. I don't know. It, I don't know. There's something about this that just it gets to me. And then, like I said, the, the other scene for me uh, is whenever, you know, him and her are in the cave or in the, the, the mine. And he leaves her for, and you know where it's going. You know, even you know, I, I, I've seen the spoiler. I've seen this before because I know the, how you know how it ended or whatever. But like, he leaves and he comes back to get her. And when he goes to kiss her, he can tell right away because he's you know emotionless or supposed to be anyways. And just when she kind of opens her eyes to him, and he realizes this is not her. It's just there's something about that that also just freaks me out. It gives me the creeps. Um, my only complaint about this movie really is I felt like a lot of the pod people, they weren't really showing that emotionless side to him as much. Like, whenever he's talking, like, when I, uh, with it's the girl's cousin's parents, or maybe there's her aunt, uncle, I don't know. Either way, but she's like, you know, my uncle, he's, it's not him. And she's freaking out. But when he goes to talk to him, the guy's, like, cutting up with him and cracking jokes. Like, he's not showing an emotionless side. He's showing happy emotions and even like the when the son finds out his mom is like that and then you see they're both been taken over they're showing a very bright bouncy lovey dovey kind of relationship and it's just like again it's like well that's an emotion i feel like these the future remakes would really kind of hone that in better where it does give off a creepy vibe whenever you would talk to these people so i don't know that's my only nitpick, and that's a very tiny nitpick, uh, in my opinion. I still think this movie's incredible, and it would only get better with the remakes. I will say this is probably my third in the in the lineup. I'd go 1978 first, then the 90s, and then this one, and then the Nicole Kidman one. But, let me reiterate, Nicole Kidman's back up on the list. Like, Just because my least favorite of the remakes does not mean it's a bad movie. I feel like the next time I watch that, I'm going to... Love it even more. So, uh, this thing is a 7.7 .7 on IMDb, a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, and God damn it, it made three million at the box office back in 1956. Uh, that is Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So, guys, for a quick rundown here, our inducting class into the Horror Hall of Fame of 1956 was Wallace Fox, or sorry, Wallace Fox, Evelyn Key, Val Luton, Glenn Strange, Edgar Wallace, and George Zuko. And the four films that we ranked from 1956 in the world of horror was, at number four, Man Beast. Number three, and winner of the Bronze Skull Award, The Black Sleep. Number two, winner of the Silver Skull Award, The Mole People. And number one, winner of the Golden Skull Award, we're talking about Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So, 
I want to thank everybody who tuned in to listen. Uh, on behalf of the Retro Horror Academy, my name's Daniel Richardson, and uh, yeah, you are dismissed.